What is up, everyone? This is the Chillin' with the Villain podcast where we sit down and watch classic retro wrestling pay per views. Then we come on this podcast and we talk about it. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it in the middle? Does it hold up? We ask all those questions. And today, as always, is a very special edition of the Chillin' with the Villain podcast because we are in the third part of our first Mick Foley retirement story arc. Did I get that right? <laughs> that sounds about right. So for those of you wondering what that is, Mick Foley recently has come out and said that he wants to have a match, a, a proper retirement match or one last match for his 60th birthday. And that got us asking the questions, oh, what happened the first time that Mick Foley tried to retire back in 2000? So for the last few weeks we have covered the royal rumble 2000 no way out 2000 and that brings us to today's episode which is wrestlemania 2000 and it's very apparent because we are in wrestlemania season right now it's a very exciting time to be a wrestling fan there's all sorts of things going on the rock is back causing trouble but we want to know what was he doing 24 years ago and we will answer those questions today as we review wrestlemania 2000 how do you feel about that sam that until this point we had you know wrestlemania one two three and so on all the way up to 15 and now we're about a 16 because of wrestlemania 2000 they just decided for that year actually we're going to name it after the year not the number of wrestlemanias yeah i actually like this as a complete one-off but then we they also call 17 x7 so it's like it's still 17, kind of, but yeah, why did they just decide to mix it up in the middle? Now, <laughs> 2000, what do you think of when you think of WrestleMania 2000 and the black and the green? I just think of LOD 2000. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, I, I, I feel like the point you're trying to get at is around this sort of time or towards the late 90s, just putting like 2000 on everything was a very popular thing. And people right. loved the year 2000. It's like, oh, something 2000, whatever 2000. So I guess they decided to go this route with WrestleMania. I thought you were going to say, when you think of WrestleMania 2000, you think of the video game. Yeah. Do you know what? I didn't play that that much because by the time I got into the N64 games, No Mercy was already out. Mm. So I went from Revenge to No Mercy. Now I kind of missed the part in between. You seem to play, have played a lot, maybe more 2000 than I did. Because you brought it up. This is not the first time you brought it up. Quite possibly. Show. Yeah. I mean, No Mercy was well, was somewhat better, I yeah. guess, than WrestleMania 2000. But st still both great games. Very good. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of video games, the new 2K24 that's coming out has got people kind of up in arms over the attributes, you know, the uh, points that they give the superstars in each category, like charisma, strength, like toughness, strength, all of that. They, Logan Paul is sitting at a 90 and that's got people up in arms. Like right? a 90 overall. 90 overall. Yeah. Out of a hundred. I don't see now, a problem with that. Well, it's kind of high, but he's also very popular. Cody, they've also given a 93. Now, We've had, we, we've talked about shrinkflation. We've talked about greedflation. There's definitely a case of attributeflation in these 2K games over the years, right? Have you noticed? I would put, if it was me, I'd put Logan Paul down to like an 85 and maybe Cody at like an 89. That's what I would do. I feel like somebody needs to go in, look at the, all of the stats and like normalize them like across the 2k game library and do a proper job and bring it back down to earth what do you reckon or don't you care uh, are you like mark chindrak and you didn't care and only i care about this i can honestly say i don't really care but hang on here's my question cody rhodes i guess other than Ro other than roman reigns is pretty much the top guy in the company so if he can't have 93 like who can yeah, well, they'll sell you the DLC classics, right? They'll sell you Stone Cold as DLC and make him a 95. But that is kind of, you do bring up a point. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it's just whoever is popular 
gets higher attributes. It's not necess- It's more of a popularity contest than an actual kind of ranking. So that would explain these numbers, right? Because yes, yeah. So people have split opinions on this. I would prefer the more kind of um, top Trumpy, you know, like stat kind of like real stat sort of thing. But whatever. Is that not the case? Is it not like oh, speed this amount number, strength this number? It is, but it's based around popularity ultimately you get more points if you're popular so yeah hey so you're super popular so now you're more speedy than you were last year so like apollo cruz is probably not very strong even though he is actually pretty strong right. in real life we get yeah it's the mark jindrak syndrome <laughs> once again once again it's crazy now on to something that isn't up for debate because it's just tabling people is always great you did be proud, didn't you, recently, huh? <laughs> I didn't do anything for you, Sam, that's for sure. Oh. Um, I, I assume you're referring to the video that I'm sure everyone has seen by now. This last Saturday, I wrestled in Tijuana for AAA in the main event, and one Penta El Zero Mero decided to give me a package pile driver for a table. Now, I'd come to Tijuana, to AAA, to show them a traditional wrestling match. You know, I like classic wrestling. That's why I have this podcast. I wanted to go out there and give them a great wrestling match. And then Penta El Zero Mero decides he wants to turn this into a garbage trash match. Like, it's, what is a table doing in the wrestling ring anyway? It was barbaric. It was unsafe. It put me in a very horrible position. Imagine this, right? People are like, oh, that's great. Ha, 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 ha. Imagine being lifted up, right? And your arms are being held by your side and then someone's driving you down so you land on your head and neck through a table onto the mat. Not a nice experience for me whatsoever. So I lost a lot of respect for Pentagon or Penta El Zero Romero, whatever you want to call, it, call him. But I will promise this. I will be back in AAA and I do promise to get my revenge. And I'm going to steal that mask of his. And I don't, I don't even want to tell you what I want to do with that mask. But oh, can't, 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 can't he just, you know, do, do a different wrestling move or maybe learn some wrestling holds, maybe a sleeper hold or a Boston crab. Why has it got to be a package pile driver for a table? You know, who invented the package pile driver was my good friend, PCO. Penta didn't even invent the package pile driver. Now he's doing it to people, innocent people like myself. Through tables is just uncalled for, Sam. Rude, so, yeah. is it? No. That's it's very rude. It's a great way of putting it. Very rude. You were a guest to the country. Exactly. And that's exactly. how they treated you. Yeah. Disgusting. All right. <laughs> Shall we though get straight on to the pay-per-view? WrestleMania Let- 2000. Let's do it. WrestleMania 2000, baby. California love. A bit of a weird start, as before the opening video package, we have come to expect three episodes in now to our three-episode arc. We don't get our opening video package straight up. We are instead greeted immediately to an establishing shot of the event location. Now, the Toyota Center, but then the Arrowhead Pond of Anaheim. Can you guess what city that is in, Marty? The Arrowhead Pond of Anaheim. Is it not in Anaheim? That is correct. Very good. Also, incidentally, do you know what the Arrowhead Pond of Anaheim is home to which sporting team? No idea. I, American sports teams, I have no idea about any of well, them. You should know this one. This is it's the Mighty Ducks. The oh, Anaheim okay. <laughs> Ducks ice hockey team is formerly the Mighty Ducks from the oh, Disney. That's quite cool. Who Disney created. Yes. So, yes, very nice. Anaheim, California. The date is April 2nd. Can you guess the year, though, WrestleMania 2000 happened, Mark? <laughs> I'm going to guess 2000. I would you are doing incredibly well so mm-hmm. far. Keep this up. All this right. is why I'm a wrestling expert. Yeah, you bring the trivia. <laughs> right, we see Lillian Garcia sing the national anthem, so that's nice, isn't it, Marty? But then we get our video package, and it shows a quick glimpse, and I mean a very quick glimpse, of WrestleMania's past up until this point, okay? 
It then says, that was then, this is now, which is an obvious thing to say, right? Marty, did you know that the past was then and the present is now? Because <laughs> I did. And then tries to put over the fatal four-way main event. So it just segues straight into like, now we're just putting over the main event. Focusing on how dysfunctional the McMahon family is in a way that I would call an attempt at being like Springer-esque, you know? What kind of family did I marry into from Triple H? Stephanie slapped her own mother. It's just crazy. The voiceover <laughs> guy, for some reason, changes halfway through. I don't know why. And I would say that this video package was average at best, but really the average quality of WWE opening video packages is actually very high. So I'd say that this one would, I'd actually call kind of like a dud. But what do you say? <sighs> well, yeah, kind of a dud. I mean, I think I feel like that's the theme for this whole entire pay-per-view. So, <laughs> right, And don't forget, we're in a three-episode arc and we're coming off of Royal Rumble 2000 and No Way Out 2000. Think of their opening packages, you know? So definitely a step down in my eyes. The crowd didn't seem to care, though, as it was frigging packed in there. 19,776 in attendance, okay? Pretty high, man. Now, would you like to guess the buy rate as you're on such a roll already? Damn. I feel like I, I remember there was one year that the Royal Rumble did a better buy rate than WrestleMania. And I'm trying to remember if it was this one. Oof. I feel like it might have been. I'm going to say, mind you, the paper, even though Way Out did really good numbers, I'm going to say, I could be really wrong here, 650. It wasn't the year. You're thinking okay. of a different year. Yep. It's the other way. It's just so higher. It's probably like 730. Dude, Even this, more? this shocked me. Yeah, yeah. Like 850? 824,000, right? Jeez. And the thing is about these buy rates is they're just the US. Well, you yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. Right? Nuts <laughs> to think about, right? Yeah, 820. <laughs> I know it's a WrestleMania. I know it's the year 2000, it's WWE, but 824,000 buys just in the US is crazy talk. This Pretty is going to be like talk. some of the highest, maybe even the highest buy rates so far in the company, I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, the buy rates for the last two pay-per-views we covered were huge in themselves. Just just money-making machine WWE in this time, right? Yeah. Still is now, but yeah. Yeah, they were doing crazy numbers in 2000, blimey. Peacock cuts Ice T's rap version of The Godfather's new music because, I, can I say this? We can cut this out because they are sad pieces of shit. <laughs> well, I remember the song was pretty cool as well. It's, you got Pippin' It, Pippin' It, Easy yeah. Man, Pippin' It, Pippin' It, Easy Man. And they, I guess they just didn't have the rights to it, clearly. So, well, oh, they just... what's funny is right at the end of the pay per view, they show kind of like what happened earlier in the day and they show a clip of that. So it's like they can they, they can show it. They just chose not to for some. But they could probably show it, but they probably can't. We can't hear it. Yeah. Well, they there was a little bit of I, uh, of ice tea wrapping in it, oh. but maybe they're only allowed three seconds before they get copyright struck, which is more than we're allowed. Anyways, <laughs> that would have been a lovely lead in to the first match where Big Boss Man and Bull Buchanan defeat Godfather and D'Lo Brown in a very plodding nine minutes. Also. The Shield stole Bill Buchanan's outfit, and I won't be convinced otherwise. <laughs> it's funny, when The Shield came around, I, I just said, like, oh, they're, they're dressed like the boss man, and Bull, Bull Buchanan. Bull right. Buchanan. It's quite a hard name to say, actually, right? Hard, isn't it? Yeah. Dude, WrestleMania 2000 is a really funny and strange one. Very funny and strange, because I'm not sure if you noticed this, but there's only one singles match on the whole pay-per-view, which is the cat fight, where in that match, to win the match, you just have to throw your opponent out the ring. So mm -hmm. there's not one, like one-on-one -on -one traditional singles match on this whole entire pay-per-view. It's all multi-mans and tag matches, etc. cetera. Um, not only that, but they put a bunch of random matches on the, the show, this being one of them. They have this match, then later they have TNA against Head Cheese. Yeah. Some really random matches, but I thought this way to start the show, don't know really what they were thinking. I'm guessing they thought, oh, start with the Godfather and Ice-T. That's quite a nice way to start the show, yeah. which is not a terrible idea, but they make the match like two minutes, not nine minutes. <laughs> it was nine minutes, dude. That's too but, much for me. Bull Buchanan, he, they, they gave him quite a lot of tries. So mm. clearly he had a lot of 
potential in the fact that he was very agile. He was very athletic. He could for his jump size, up, yeah. for his size. He's a big guy. He's probably like six six or something. He could move around the ring, jump to the top rope, do a big cool leg drop. And they tried. He originally they, they brought him in in the uh, Truth Commission in what ninety seven ninety eight. Then they tried him again here with the Boss Man. Then they tried him out in the Right to Censor he was in, which, funny enough, he was teaming up with Godfather then. And then they mm. tried him out for a few weeks as like John Cena's Peter or Bodyguard when he was B squared or whatever it was. Never really worked out for uh, Bull Buchanan whatsoever, um, even though they tried, which is a shame. I was quite a fan as a youngster. but um, Me too. Yeah, he was cool, but he had no chance in this era. Um, but yeah, just a... A match could have, honestly, this match could have been on Sunday Night Heat, let alone Raw or SmackDown. Here it's the opening match of WrestleMania 2000. Not a great way to start the pay-per-view. I feel like that phrase, this match could have been on Sunday Night Heat, is going to crop up quite often in this podcast <laughs> review, right? I, I just have a feeling. Yeah. Do you know what? I didn't hate the match. Like, I didn't mind it, but it could have been done in half the time. Absolutely. Okay. So we, see- we could have been done in half the time. This next match, oof. Oh, no. <laughs> no. No. Please. What a we see, we see earlier in the day, an official, a WWE official, explain clearly the rules of the match we have next. Now, remember I said that, that a WWE official is there clearly explaining the rules. He uses the word clearly in it. He's also refereeing the match. We'll get to that. Just remember, keep that in your mind. The rules of the match we have next. The incredibly memorable Hardcore Battle Royal. 13 men, okay? We've got Taz, Viscera, the Mean Street Posse, our boys, right? Hardcore Holly, Takamichinoku and Funaki, Mosh and Thrasher, Farouk and Bradshaw, and Crash Holly. Okay, so the idea is it's a 15-minute time period. I disagree that it could be done half the time because, you know... I just feel like more should have happened in the time. So Viscera holds it for like seven minutes and nothing happens. We'll get to that. But the title can change hands multiple times throughout the match. And just when the time counts down to zero, whoever is it, who is champion at that time, when the bell hits and the counter each is zero, is the champion, leaves as the champion. Okay. First up, Taz does like a capture suplex on Crash straight away, straight up and pins him for three, okay? Fine. Viscera then smashes Taz into the poster on the outside, and then he does like, is it the Viscera slam? Him onto the outside, pinning him for three. All right, fine. Do you you want to interject? Well, I was going to say, Taz, he's he's fallen quite a lot since the Rumble 2000 when he squashed Kurt Angle in his debut. Here he's in this cluster, multi-man, hardcore. um, I was going to say a, a curse word, but... Um, go on, carry on. Yeah, this was and this was like three months later or two and a half months later. I think three months later. Yeah, from Royal Rumble 2000, here he is. Okay, so nearly seven minutes go by and I'll skip it, but just imagine if you haven't seen it, the camera is trying to kind of capture some sort of action. It doesn't know who to focus on. There's lots of cuts. And in the meantime, just imagine road sign saying with a speed limit or some flimsy piece of metal baking sheet you just hear that being smashed over someone's head somewhere maybe every three or four seconds nearly seven minutes go by of that when funaki gets the cover in a weird dog pile so the uh it was the acolytes right the apa they cover viscera with kai and tai for no reason i don't really understand that but they give it to funaki I think the idea was supposed to be that the Acolytes just wanted to be out there to fight, but they didn't care about winning the championship. Oh, okay. okay I gotcha. think. Okay. So Funaki gets to cover. He's now the hardcore champion. So with that, he tries to run backstage. Does kind of pick up here, in my opinion. Kind of gets fun here, in my opinion. Funaki runs backstage, but Rodney and Joey Abs from the Main Street Posse catch him, throw him into a stack of crowd barriers, and Rodney pins him. Okay? So now it's Rodney. But... Joey Abs immediately, like immediately, suplexes Rodney onto the concrete and pins him. So Rodney was champion for about 11 seconds, okay? 
So you've got the longest of the night, like seven minutes for Viscera, and then the shortest, which was Rodney for like 11 seconds. Okay, so this this match was absolutely everywhere. Very strange pacing. So Thrasher throws Rodney against the close fence, covers him, tries running back to the arena. He makes it onto the entrance ramp. Pete Gas sprays him with a fire extinguisher and pins. Now we get to the interesting stuff because you think it was bad then. It all goes to hell now. So Pete gets T-bone suplex onto Taz on the outside. Taz gets another pin victory. So it's like, okay, it's Taz. Now listen to what happens next. Mosh keeps trying to pin Taz, which is fair play, right? But for one moment, Taz inexplicably tries pinning Mosh. He did that a couple of times. Right, here's the thing. The ref actually tries counting it. The same (laughs) ref who at the start was like, these are the rules and they're very clear. It turns out he knew the least about the match than anyone. Taz tries pinning Hardcore Holly and again, the ref goes to count it. Then Taz tries pinning Crash and again, the ref tries counting it. Eventually... Crash pins Taz, gets a three count, despite Taz actually kicking out of it. So the one time the referee would have been right, he gets it, he calls it wrong. Taz tries to lock in a uh, Taz mission into Crash. And as the countdown to the 15-minute match ends, Hardcore Holly smashes a sweet jar over Crash Holly's head and pins him in the final second. Now, this part you're going to have to explain to me because it goes crazy. Despite the ref in the final second, okay, refusing to do the three count... So I assume the finish went wrong. And the commentators said, pretended that Crash got showed up when he didn't. They gave it to Hardcore Holly. So what happened? It was a mess. Dude, this finish was a complete and utter mess. It took me a little bit of time to work out exactly what happened. And uh, I think I worked out what happened. So Crash was supposed to win the, the or come out as champion, okay, to win the match, right? And the idea was that he would come out just by the skin of it. The idea being that Hardcore Holly would cover him in the last two seconds. So it'd be like one, two on the count, but then the time would run out. That was the idea. Okay. So it hits zero and then the final count, it's like, no, it's still crash. Correct. Okay. Correct. But I guess (laughs) the timing was off and they were all going on what Tim White was telling them. I assume time wise. I mean, I, either way, I'm pretty sure Tim White ended up getting the blame for this. But anyway, what actually happened was, is he hit him with the jar he covers him one, two, but the timer hasn't run out yet. There's still like one or two seconds left on the timer. So Tim White puts the hand down, but kind of stops himself from counting free which, to the point where commentators try to suggest that, oh, Crash got a shoulder up. He got a shoulder up, which obviously he did not. I guess no one clued up Howard Finkel on anything because then Howard Finkel says, oh, the winner of this match hardcore holly and even he when he says it it sounds completely unsure yeah but what's funny as well is crash and hardcore holly have the same entrance music so they obviously had crash's music lined up mm-hmm. and it's the same <laughs> as hardcore holly's anyway um so then hardcore holly's got the belt and then you see him like crash is trying to run away with the belt it's almost like he doesn't even realize what's happened right there's a close-up of hardcore in the ring saying the F word to himself, like even bearing in mind, he's just won the championship, but he's cursing because it messed up the, the finish. Yeah. Then you hear Jim Ross on commentary being like, Oh, I, I think we might have a re- reverse decision here. I think we're gonna, uh, the referee has reversed the decision. And then he's like, Oh no, they haven't. <laughs> it's just right. such a mess. It right. was such a mess. And they kept replaying it. It's like, dude, just move on. Move on. Um, t- um, the referee, Tim White, like re- not putting his final hand down on the thing. Isn't that like a no-no? If something's going to go wrong, aren't you supposed to call it as if it's real? Like, and just... Yeah, he had to count the three. If the guy yeah. doesn't kick out or whatever, it's, it's down yeah. to them. So apparently he got really berated for this. He had a rough night at this WrestleMania 2000. I right, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, he got in a lot of trouble. But dude, yeah. I mean, this the hardcore 24-7 thing was kind of fun for what it was and yeah when they were doing you know the segments where they're going around like uh fairgrounds and stuff it was all pretty funny this match clearly no one decided to put this match together to make it you know entertaining Coherent. whatsoever yeah. what i didn't understand was is that they just all fought on the floor outside the ring and nobody was using the ring and like you said the camera people didn't know where to uh, you know who to focus on at least if you got a bunch of guys fighting on the floor but some guys running spots in the ring, they can cover what's in the ring, you know, and that's where all the cameras are pointing yes. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but all the guys did was just hit each other the whole time over the heads with different gimmicks and weapons. It, to me, it doesn't make sense. Surely you've got to pin the champion to win the championship, right? 
So surely whoever the champion is, everyone should be going for the champion. No, like, like right. why would you even bother? For, I mean, obviously I understand that you're trying to stop the other person from getting the champion, but a lot of the time it's like the whole, everyone in the match would be ignoring the champion, which makes no sense. The only time it kind of picked up or made any sense was in Fanaki won the belt and then he tried to run away. It's like, okay, well, at least it actually makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it would have been more entertaining for me. I think if you just kept running around the arena, trying to avoid, you know, avoid everyone for 15 minutes, but um, no. And then the finish, just a complete and utter cluster, but yeah, there was no high spots in the match. There was, it was just a complete mess. I just, I was not a fan. And 15 minutes of it as well. I was like, oh, it could at yeah. least been 10 minutes, you know, just, I don't know. It was, it was not good. Yeah. You weren't a fan. Now, given everything that we just said about it, this was my match of the night. Okay. So Jesus. at the end of this, you can decide if that says more about me or the pay per view <laughs> that we're about to cover. All right. They show a behind the scenes peak of WWF Access, which is like a convention pre-show meet and greet. Michael Cole says there's a section where fans can do a play-by-play -play with him in one of five of the greatest matches in WWE history. And the camera pans across. And what match is it, Marty? It's the Royal Rumble 2000 Street Fight. So there you go. Even WWE, or at least Michael Cole, officially call it a top five match ever. I noticed that. I did see that. Speaking of top five, we see Steve Blackman. Okay. <laughs> Only he's in the box with Al Snow. <laughs> Steve, St Steve knows Al is up to tomfoolery and is trying to get to the bottom of it. Okay. All the while, Chester McCheeserton is taking a nasty dump. The we'll get to Chester in a minute. Okay. Okay. This pay per view, man. Anyway, <laughs> this is WrestleMania for crying out loud. This is WrestleMania, and we'll get to that. Yeah. The greatest camera shot in wrestling history zooms out to show Trish, Tess, and Albert setting up the next match, a seven-minute head cheese versus TNA affair, because you wanted one of those, didn't you? Where Tess elbow drops his way to victory. Even JR's headset didn't want to be anywhere near this match and kept malfunctioning. But the noises, of, by the way, of his headset malfunctioning were awful. And it's just... On top of everything about this pay-per-view, not even it's not even the production level we expect from WWE from a live right. event. You know, it's kind of slapdash, and this is an example of it. Mate, dude, this match. I love Steve. Actually, I think I like everyone in this match, but this was a dud, no? Dude, so that made me laugh so much. Jim Ross's um, his <laughs> headset just was not working and making all this noise. And I thought, you know, especially after that complete cluster of a finish of the hardcore match. And then this happening right away afterwards, I was like, geez, this pay per view is just all over the place. Considering the year 2000, many consider like the greatest year for the WWF in wrestling. WrestleMania is supposed to be the biggest pay per view, which ironically, I feel like all the pay per views in the year 2000 were all good. Other than this one, this one is just overbooked and horrible. The, what really, it really did pop me and make me laugh on that. Was it a pre-tape of Test? Albert and Trish walking to the ring and it just starts with this big zoom as close as possible on Trish's tits, all her oiled up boobies. It was just like, it just hits you in the face. Like blimey. Like, like it made me think like, well, like they were, they were just, they were savage back in the attitude era. They but were. um, dude, I did not understand about this match. First of all, why it was on the show. But second of all, head cheese, Al Snow mm. and Steve Blackman are supposed to be the baby faces. Test right. and Albert are the heels. But for some reason, they structure this match where head cheese take heat on Prince Albert and then gives Test the hot tag. I did not understand that whatsoever. And neither did the crowd. Also, it did not protect. You can, you can tell watching this match why Albert, never became a top guy because they do not protect Albert's size whatsoever. Here he's taking sweeps. He's taking clotheslines. He's taking back elbows. He's taking suplexes. Like they're just throwing him around like he's nothing. Yeah. And he's this big giant guy. But yeah, the match was a complete mess. Um, and that's another thing I don't understand. Like Al Snow comes across like a psychological wrestling genius. And then I'm watching this in the year 2000. He'd already been wrestling a long time by this point. And this match is just absolute <laughs> terrible. And the Chester McCheeserson or whatever it was, who like is that something that I should know? 
I don't think so. So Chester McCheeserton, if you haven't seen this, is he's a little person, a Hispanic little person who's dressed as a wedge of cheese. OK, because Al Snow wants a new gimmick for Steve Blackman because he finds him boring. He's paired with Steve Blackman, but finds him boring, which is true. So he needs a nice gimmick for him. So he's going to go for this head cheese angle because he can't let go of head. And so now he needs a cheese mascot and it's Chester McCheeserton. And there's no nothing else that you need to know. There's nothing clever or funny about it. Then right at the end, they lose the match. So they take it out on poor little Chester McCheeserton who gets the guillotine leg drop on him. And like you said, these are supposed to be the good guys. Right, and they're beating up a defenseless little person. So, yeah, yeah. and by this point, like we're three matches in, and they've just Mm -hmm. been killing this crowd, which I assume in the first place would have been hot and ready to go. And just what they've given them so far, the crowd is just dying and dying to the point where this crowd pretty much struggles throughout the majority of the show. And these first three matches haven't helped things or haven't helped contribute to that. So. Yep, we'll excuse the Battle Royal, Hardcore Battle Royal, but I would say this is the second instance of this would be fine for Sunday Night Heat, not for WrestleMania. (laughs) Yes, 100%, I agree. We have another wardrobe malfunction backstage as a skit involving strategically placed props with Mae Young and the cat is supposed to block the view of the cat's breasts, but you see them anyway. I said tits the other week on the podcast, which isn't appropriate. So this week I'm saying breasts. Actually, you just said it anyway, so it doesn't matter. You already said the bad word. Also, for a split second, you get to see old Roland Rat. I don't know if you noticed that, but you did. So I have a story about this, okay? there Back in the day, I was like 11 or 12 when this came out, and there was a VHS copy that was circulating around our school, okay? Because somebody recorded it. It was, I guess, was this on Channel 4 as well? Or yeah, I think, Sky? Or, I think okay. it was on Channel 4, yeah. Yeah, so some someone in the school recorded it. It was my turn to have it, okay? I skived off of school, pretended I was sick, and I stayed at my grandma's, and I watched it. And at this bit... And a bit later, my grandma chewed out my mum when my mum came to pick me up for letting me watch this stuff at 12 years old. (laughs) And it was this, it was this skit. Yep. Dude, I felt like watching this skit. This seemed like inappropriate for me to watch as a grown man. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) I know. They, 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 one point Mae Young is holding up a t-shirt with like, and she says, oh, I like the one with the pussycat on it. And it's got a picture of like a pussycat's face and she's holding it up over the cat's vagina, yeah. like yeah. her naked vagina. I was, I was watching this like, well, I'm surprised, honestly, I'm surprised they even kept this in on the network or on Peacock, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> like, Me too. They just... cut out iced tea, right? Yeah. The good bit, the only good bit of the pay-per-view and they kept this in. Yeah. Yeah. It was like borderline. Well, it was, it was like soft porn. It was then. soft. Yeah. Basically. Right? Yeah. 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 Pretty crazy. <laughs> okay. So you've been good today, Marty. So I think you deserve to talk about an absolute banger. Okay. The Dudleys versus Edge and Christian versus the Hardys triangle ladder match for the tag team championship. Now it's long. It's 23 minutes long. But, oh, by the way, I also know that you're going to have two big criticisms of this. But outside of that, and we'll definitely get to those. I just think that the level of kind of inventiveness and creativity on display, as well as just like the sheer entertainment factor of this match was nothing short of uh, incredible. And obviously the first TLC match, which happens later on in, in, in the past, in history, whatever, you know, in the future from 2000, the first TLC match is kind of famous. But honestly, I, think, I feel like the table spots from Royal Rumble 2000 were better than the first TLC and the ladder spots from this were better. What do you think, man? Well, clearly, we said about the hardcore battle royal, whatever you want to call it, earlier, with the guys who just just did not try whatsoever. Yeah. Here, clearly, all six guys tried, and they clearly spent a lot of time putting this together and were trying to be inventive with all the spots and everything that they did in it. So, yeah, I can't take away from that. They, you know, there's a bunch of risks like. It was pretty. It was pretty brutal at a few points. Just some of the risks they were taking, and some of the weapon shots and everything else, and the bumps they were taking. Especially oh, yeah. the first half of the match, I was getting a bit annoyed because it felt like they weren't really attempting to climb the ladder at all to grab the belts. 
It yeah, that's be. my. I knew that would be your first main criticism yeah, for sure. Yeah, because um, they simply didn't. Well, they simply didn't, which I think they got better at as time went on. Obviously, they end up doing you know a handful of TLC matches. One thing I did notice was that Edge and Christian came out to the ring to pretty much no reaction, and obviously that heel turn that should he, it had not too much longer after this was absolutely essential for Edge and Christian because it felt like when they were still baby faces and, and the Hardy boys were still baby faces, it kind of felt like it was like, what do Edge and Christian have over the Hardy boys? Do you know what I mean? It seems like it's kind of like almost the same gimmick, but the Hardy boys took more risks. So they were more popular than Edge and Christian. They were like a less good version of the Hardy boys. Then yeah. they turned heel and then they could really show their personality and everything else. So they actually, if anything stood out over the Hardy boys, but no, I mean, I can't obviously, I really can't take away anything from this match. Um, the famous one-time bomb that Jeff gives hmm. Bubba Ray, which is just insane to think about. And what I never noticed until watching it this time is Jeff has Bubba on the table far too close to the ladder where he basically has to fall off the ladder. He can't jump out. He just has to fall off. And pretty much his top of his shoulder blades the top of his shoulder blades hits Baba, and he pretty much takes the whole bump on his ass on the floor. Yeah. You think, oh, like this is the this sort of bump you basically want to land your whole back on Baba and let Baba eat it. It's going to suck for Baba, yeah. but it's going to say, you know, he's not going to die from it. Whereas if you right. just flip and land on your ass on the floor, that could probably kill you. So, um, no, I feel like this was maybe like they 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 talk about the ladder match that Edge and Christian and the Hardy boys had from No Mercy as being the breakout match for those guys. But I actually think maybe it might be this match, um, if not the first TLC match. But yeah, and that last bump that Matt Hardy took <laughs> when he gets pushed off the, yeah. uh, the table, dude, he just completely destroys that table at the bottom there just into like so many pieces. Like to like the <laughs> molecular level, just like yes. turns into dust. Yeah. It does, it does. It's no, crazy. Can't really take away any, uh, anything from these guys in this match. Yeah, I thought your second criticism would be it's a ladder match, but they bust out tables willy-nilly. It just becomes a hardcore match. It loses focus, mm -hmm. which I kind of didn't mind because obviously I love tables, but it's also true. You know, it does lose focus. But I mean, because they were they were already unfocused because they weren't going for the belt. So it just becomes like a fracas. They use chairs in this match as well, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. So it's basically TLC. It's essentially, do, what's yeah. the difference between this and TLC other than title? Right. There is none. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I would say that you said that this seems to be the breakout spot if, if you were going to be asked for Edge and Christian. And you also said it, it seems like they're just like a more, like a less risk-taking version of the Hardys, which is true. I feel like this match showed like the difference between them more. They're like the more kind of like wily and sly version. You know, they yeah. wait until sure. they have a chance. Whereas... The Hardys are just too headstrong. And they're just like too energetic and they just go for it. Whereas Edge and Christian actually kind of like play out their match in a completely different way. They wait, they bide their time. They're more kind of cerebral. So I thought that was very good. Now there's a blink and you miss it kind of like underrated bump, if you ask me in this, that Jeff takes. Because after he and Matt double team uh, Baba, they're both on the ladders and he and they they land on him. Christian picks Jeff up and he they and he throws him out of the ring where Jeff does a 180 flip and lands straight on his back. Only this was through the middle rope. I can't even imagine how he managed to get the speed and the angle and everything just right to be able to do a flip through the middle rope, between the middle rope and the top rope, and also get that momentum off it to where he actually clears the mat around the ring, lands on the entrance ramp. It was nuts. I've done just, that before oh okay well there you go also marty has done it as well there you go but yeah i just thought it's very athletic to be able to kind of maneuver within such a small amount of space i, I would be able to do it but yeah, yeah i really enjoyed this match it just lacks the pure nostalgia um otherwise i mean no, could be, to be honest like i'd say that this is probably the match of the night but we'll get there but it's not my favorite match of the night it's a lot of fun also bubba with the rko before randy orton yeah well the diamond cutter yeah, yeah. Which he got from DDP. Yeah. <laughs> Mick Foley and Linda McMahon are backstage, and Mick Foley says, bang, bang, dis despite not being on his Cactus Jack persona. And it's like, when he does that as Mick Foley, he wears a kind of Cactus Jack-esque shirt and outfit and says, bang, bang. It's just like, 
why you know that further kind of um dilutes you know we were saying we're already kind of seeing it and no way out it's kind of like mick foley in a cactus jack outfit now he just clearly is like he's just became that so uh, kind of a strange thing am i fair in saying i feel like mm. this very much so after watching these pay-per-views do you think it's fair to say that mick foley is the worst face of the uh five faces of foley yeah for sure right <laughs> i think so well, all he does is get fired and <laughs> hold his hand up and looks back kind of. So my, my dog isn't as playful as Winston, right? But sometimes she does want to play. And she actually did that shortly before we had to record this. And I was like, sorry, no, I can't. You know, I've got to talk about WrestleMania 2000 for two hours with Marty. She gave the exact same look as when Mick Foley just walks backwards and like <laughs> after being fired. That's all he does. That's all what's, he does. It reminds me of my dog. What's Mick Foley's fascination with flannel shirts as well? I know. I know. <laughs> Like, you know, like the Bart Simpson wardrobe. Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, Mick Foley's got the same one, right? It's just Cactus Jack stuff, like the flannel shirts and the black pants. I mean, dude, we're going to get to it, but a McMahon in every corner. Mick, Mick really got the uh, short straw there as well, right? <laughs> Linda, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Linda McMahon. Oh, wow. I'm definitely going right. to win the world title now, but yeah oh this pay-per-view come on let's get for it all right so that was a great match though wasn't it that but it's also a lot to uh come down from like oh we need a breather okay well you know what things- we need you know what we need we need a singles match on this pay-per-view a really nice good traditional singles contest a really good strong one yep and we also need to, yes because it's been very chaotic we need to focus we need to bring it down we need singles competitor matches something with less chaos okay Well, they've got you covered with the bringing it down a few notches and I guess technically singles with our next match, the cat fight with Terry and the cat, which isn't really technically a singles match, but we'll get to that, where Terry wins by throwing the cat out of the ring because that's how they work, these cat fight (laughs) matches. It's just under two and a half minutes. Okay. First up, there is good in this. Okay. I've really tried. I tried to be positive. I've got first up the good. Val Venus is the special guest referee. And I'd say that is the perfect pick for a guest referee for this type of match. It's Val Venus. It makes sense. So, by the way, he says, even though WrestleMania comes once a year, the big Val Boski comes every night. And again, my grandma, I remember she popped off at my mom over this. <laughs> uh, Fabulous Muller and Mae Young are valets. I guess that's mildly fun, but that's it, right? Val Venus's referee outfit, because we're, we're, we take res- special guest referee outfits very seriously on this podcast, is all wrong. He's got like a referee patterned towel and just a generic Val Venus shirt, like product placement uh, merchandise shirt. He should have the official referee top and his standard white towel right that would look way better also even jr admits that this is a dud before it begins Did you notice <laughs> yeah. that by saying there's no point scoring this on a star point scoring system so, uh, yeah not only is it awful it didn't make sense because may young is distracting the ref at the detriment to her own competitor um, and then to capstone how terrible this was, they play the cat's music despite her losing. And then when the music is over, it blips back on for a second. And then it does it again. Just more sloppy production. Dude. I think I think JR says at the start, he says something like, um, you know, well, the, these two you're like aren't experienced scrapplers to say the least. And it's like, well, yeah, because both of them, not only are they both wearing normal clothes to wrestle in. Well, normal, <laughs> no, by the, normal, normal for them. Yeah. Normal for them. <laughs> But they're both wrestling in super thick high heels as well. Yeah. They're both wrestling in heels. It's like, what the hell? Um, but yeah, I also think this was like a few weeks after Mae Young had given birth to the hand. I think that was like just before this, I want to say. What was their obsession with Mae Young and Moolah during this time period? Like, they just thought, they must have just thought that was the funniest stuff. It, the like, funniest, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like Mae Young getting powerbombed through you know, table. Okay. At least that's kind of gets the Dudley boys over, but all this other stuff, it just felt like, man, like, I don't know, just too much, but, um, far too much. Yeah. Yeah. Again, just kind of a waste of TV time, just uh, to be the only singles match on this pay-per-view. And it's still just like ugh, a mess. Pretty bad. I would honestly go as far as to say, this is probably one of the worst WrestleMania matches of all time which also got me thinking about, you know, what were the worst matches in WrestleMania history? So Sam, I think you know what time it is. 
It's time for Muddy and Sam's Top 5. As you may have guessed, today's Top 5 is Worst WrestleMania Matches. I wanted to do the best WrestleMania matches, but Sam preferred worst. This is our first WrestleMania on the podcast that we're covering, right? And I don't think it's worthy of doing the top five, like, best something. Let's get the worst out. WrestleMania. Let's just get them out of the way. Out Let's get it way. out of the way. All right. Shall I go first? Go for it. Okay. So at number five, I've got Kane versus Chavo Guerrero. And this hmm. was WrestleMania 24 because it last, it wasn't like, the most egregious, terrible thing. We'll get to those. But the thing is, it lasted less than 10 seconds. Um, now, the thing is, later on in this event, WrestleMania 2000, we get like Kane versus x and it's like implied that x can hold his own against Kane, which is fine and I accept. Why can't Chavo? Like, why, why was this on WrestleMania? Now, that is going to be a theme through mine, right? Is all of these are just... Why are they on WrestleMania? That cat versus Terry Street fight that we just talked about. We're using the phrase, this should have been on Sunday Night Heat, not on WrestleMania. That shouldn't have even been on Sunday Night Heat, right? <laughs> and a couple of these are also in that category. So my number five is kind of a safe one, but it just didn't make sense. Like why squash Chavo if he's kind of, as he's, he's, I feel like he's physically bigger than X-Pac who can hold his own against Kane. It's just illogical. It just shouldn't have been on the show. Okay, number four, I had to look up the name of the guy, Akebono, Mm -hmm. versus The Big Show, because this was WrestleMania 21. And again, I feel like they should know better around like WrestleMania 20 onwards. You got The Big Show in his little diaper. These matches where it's like a wrestler versus something else. So there's Lawrence Taylor versus Bam Bam Bigelow, which I actually didn't mind. I know a lot of people complain about that. That's not in my top five. I know because Lawrence Taylor kind of beats Bam Bam, it's kind of bad. I guess that's kind of bad for business or whatever. I don't know. It didn't bother me that much because look at the, you know, look at him. Like he's he's a big guy. But this whole like making big, like making wrestling look like a farce on your own WrestleMania. Like this is your <laughs> Super Bowl and you're making your own sport or entertainment look like a farce. Why would you do that? Like that, this one is just like, I'm questioning this one. Like, what was the goal? Do you uh, even know what the goal was? Well, Akibono was a really big star in Japan, like a massive yes. star. So I'm not sure what the deal was necessarily, unless it was just trying to sell pay per views in Japan. Yeah. I actually remember being quite excited for this. I remember hearing about <laughs> it before they announced it, like in the dirt. She's like, oh, WWF is bringing Akibono in. And I was like, what? Because I knew him pretty well, you know, because he, do- he also did, did a lot really? of- not as a person, but oh, I, wow. um, I've, oh, okay. you know, I'd watched him and everything else because he also did quite a bit of pro wrestling as well. He did, he had a big crossover into pro wrestling. Um, so I was looking forward to it. And then when I realized it was just a full on sumo match, I was like, oh, that kind of sucks. And then, they could not pull it off whatsoever. I don't know what happened, but it needed some of that pro wrestling razzmatazz, which you just did not have. Didn't like have, no. they did, <laughs> they did Mayweather versus Big Show at one of the WrestleManias. I can't remember which one now, and I seem to remember that being really good. But this, this definitely wasn't very good. So yeah, this the, the people sat in silence and they did not get it. And yeah, watching the Big Show parade around in a big diaper just ugh, not pretty. We could do a top five times they made the big they wheeled the big show out to embarrass him oh yeah easily 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 easily. (laughs) easily. so number three i've got and i bet this is unlike a lot of people's but it's actually not as bad as i feel like it could be it's why it's only at number three so it's goldberg versus brock lesnar wrestlemania 20 that's the one where stone cold was the referee on it Mm -hmm. so there's story behind this right so the, the fans knew that both competitors were leaving the company and were kind of trying to throw the match with their chance, boring, good, like go away, goodbye and everything. So I actually feel like that is the kind of saving grace of this. That's kind of what made it entertaining. <laughs> what is terrible about this is how old is Brock Lesnar around WrestleMania 20? He's kind of still in his prime. And this was just like, just no effort from either of them. Like, And it's like, they're just phoning it in when you know that they're both going to leave. It's kind of insulting. There's, oh, uh, finisher kickouts, which, as you know, kind of irks me to no end. It was just a complete and utter mess. Like the crowd didn't want it and made it clear. And 
the competitors didn't want to do it and made that clear. And I've never just seen such like a batting of heads between the like what the customer and you know and the product, right? It was just a very strange thing to see. And to have that on again your flagship event, very, very strange. Now they apparently had a rematch these two at WrestleMania at another WrestleMania later one. It was actually pretty good, but I've never seen it, so I can't comment. They but, did, yeah, but they kept it super short. It was like five minutes or something, yeah. Okay. This one just, well, they didn't do it for this one, but also it just had such a weird energy and atmosphere to it. It's just hard to watch. What I thought was really bizarre about this was, so the fans turned on the match, but yeah, it really seemed to get under the skin of both Lesnar and Goldberg to the point where they were both like, we're going to phone it in now because this crowd is crapping on us. Whereas I feel like mm. most professionals would be like, Oh, they're booing us both now. They, you know, just wait until we get into this. They, we're going to turn them around, you know, which they could have easily done, I think, if they started really performing. But it felt like they were both really bothered by the audience and let them dictate the match. I mean, this is my number five, so I'm, I'm speaking about it now. And okay. like, it's on my number five, and there's been far worse matches on WrestleMania, like including like this cat fight we just watched and plenty of like Miss WrestleMania battle royals and cat fights and stuff. Pageant, scound Pageant, things. Yep. But yep. You, don't, you don't expect anything from them necessarily. So right. like Gold, both Goldberg and Brock Lesnar, both main These event are your main talent. guys. Yeah. Right. So they, they you, you expect far more from them. And obviously it was really damn bad. That's why it's on my list, if that makes sense. Who, who do you blame? The unprofessionalism of them or kind of the disrespect from the audience? Oh, the rest is 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, hundred percent. The wrestlers like they still could have gone out there and, and torn it up. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Um. So yeah, for sure the wrestlers. Yeah. Number two, I've got the cat versus Terry from this WrestleMania two thousand. You've said why we just covered it. Yeah. Um. It's the only singles match on the card, and it's a cat fight that, as we stated, shouldn't even be on Sunday Night Heat, let alone WrestleMania. It was. It was just a complete mess. It was a complete tragedy, and. It, if it was on any other WrestleMania that had other, not even top tier, but any singles match, I think it wouldn't be so bad. But that's what makes this one so egregious. It's almost like a, an FU to the audience. It's like, okay, here's your singles match. We're doing what we want. Here's your singles match. You get the, uh, the cat versus Terry. Complete, complete dud. Just frustrating. It's frustrating. All right. Number one. Try and guess what my number one is. It's, it's a very kind of safe pick. It's probably on a million lists. Um. Uh, I feel like it might be the same as mine. I don't want to guess because I don't want to reveal okay. any of mine. Okay. All right. It's Bart Gunn versus Butterbean for <laughs> WrestleMania 15. No, I don't agree with this at all. Okay. I, t okay, I do. Here's the thing. It's, it's to me the same as Akabono versus the big show. Like you're, you're embarrassing your own sport on your flagship show. Right. It's just, why would, I, I just don't understand that like whatsoever. This is just such a puzzler. And then uh, what happened to Bart Gunn? <laughs> was this, or was this it? Did they, did they say no more after pretty this? Much, pretty much never recovered from this. He left the company, went and wrestled in Japan or back to all Japan. What's crazy, it's just so bizarre. I mean, the whole we could do a whole episode talking about the Brawl for All. So brawl for you know all. the Brawl for All, which they say was kind of designed for Dr. Death Steve Williams to win. But the whole thing was just so stupid because it's supposed to be like a tough guy competition, mm -hmm. but the guys have got gloves on their hands. So the guys that are like good at wrestling, good at takedowns, whatnot, they can't do anything because they've got boxing right, yeah, gloves yeah, on. Yeah. Like hardly any of them are trained boxers and Dr. Death Steve Williams might have won the thing, but then, you know, because of the city rules, he ends up tearing like a ligament in his leg or something, or something happened to his leg in the match with Bart Gunn to the point where he can barely stand, but he decides to try and fight on anyway. And then he gets knocked out, right? Yeah. And so you completely killed the career of Dr. Death Steve Williams, who had had an amazing career before, you know, especially in Japan. Like they they said they were bringing him in to feud with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Obviously that wow. never happened after yeah. getting knocked out by a mid-carder, right? Um, so then it's like, oh, but now we've made Bart Gunn. They could have turned this into something like, Let's make Bart Gunn a, a serious threat. We can have mm -hmm. Bart Gunn go after Stone Cold Steve Austin because 
yeah, he's not the most charismatic, but we've seen him knock out people now and you can work with that, right? Right. Okay, yeah. I know. Let's put him in the ring with a legitimate tough guy, a legitimate boxer. And what's crazy about this is Butterbean, I, I've seen interviews with him and he says like, yeah, I was willing to work with them. You know, he said to like them, he's like, oh, what do you want? And they said, oh no, go for it. And he's like, really? And he's like, yeah, just go for it. Do your thing. And he's like, I'm going to knock him out. And they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, go for it. And he knocked him out in like 20 seconds or something, right? And again, I need to impress upon you that WrestleMania is the premier celebration of wrestling. <laughs> right, yeah. That's its job. It's one thing. It is a celebration of wrestling. That's what makes this number one for me. The sumo wrestling one is at least it's still wrestling, technically. Right. Uh, and it was kind of funny, kind of goofy, whatever, go for a different angle. This was just, I don't know. This, this really irks me, this one. Really yeah, irks me. Yeah, I just, I just thought it was so damn stupid. Like, why didn't they work something? Do you know what I mean? Why did, because I think they did do Butterbean versus Mark Mero and they worked it and they had like, I think it ended in a disqualification when Mero hit Butterbean with the little stool in the corner. Okay, cool. But to have, to put Bart Gunn in this scenario, poor guy. Like, yo, Dude. you're going to box Butterbean. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he comes he comes on for a job, signs a contract that he's going to be a professional wrestler. And they're like, you've got to now box Butterbean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hell no. Oh, God. All right, Dude, All right here's my, it. okay, top five. My number five, Goldberg versus Brock Lesnar, WrestleMania mm-hmm. 20. Give, give him my reasons. There's been worse, t- technically worse matches, but these two guys should have been a, uh, a lot a lot better. Should have known better. Yeah. yeah. My number four, Undertaker versus Giant Gonzalez from WrestleMania 9. Mm-hmm. I wanted Giant Gonzalez to be good so badly, and he just could not be good whatsoever. This match, just awful. Yeah. Undertaker wins, but by disqualification, because Gonzalez puts the, um, what's it called? The chloroform on the, the, the napkin or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And puts it on his face. It's kind of like, ugh. Like, but... <clears throat> Poor Undertaker. Like Undertaker could have good matches if he was in there with really good workers. If yep. he was in there with average workers, it was always very average. If he was in there with bad workers, it was always very bad. And this was very, very bad. And that brings me to my number three, another Undertaker match. Undertaker versus the big boss man, WrestleMania 15 in a Hell in a Cell match. Now, the Hell in a Cell, like before this, you'd had the Shawn Michaels and... uh Undertaker won the first yeah. one. We'd had the Undertaker and Mick Foley one. So now it's like, whoa, like these are pretty, you know, big matches to level There's up. There's a to. pedigree behind the right. event of and I believe, I, yeah. I want to say this is the third one, or actually maybe it was the fourth, because I think they had one on Raw, which is like a tag with Kane and Mankind and whatnot, and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Um, but let's say, just for argument's sake, the third Hell in a Cell, Big Boss Man, Undertaker. This was an Undertaker was doing his weird, like, ministry gimmick. The crowd was sat in complete silence. It was not good. There was It was like heel versus heel. And after the match, we all remember Undertaker hangs the big boss man. This is another thing where you just can't defend it to the people that are like, oh, wrestling's stupid, wrestling's fake. And you're like, no, it's not. And then you watch this, you're like, oh, I, it makes me embarrassed to be a wrestling fan. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's also very poor taste. Like the big boss yes. man, maybe not so much then, is like kids favorite wrestlers you know growing up everyone loved the big boss man and seeing just like your hero being lynched like hung from a, <laughs> yeah. by his neck from a it's just kind of morbid yeah it's very morbid the idea who's that, that supposed to appeal to yeah. someone would be hung in like an arena in front of twenty thousand people it's disgusting yeah it's kind of disgusting Christ. right like really bad why they thought that was a good idea i just ugh. my number two Jerry Lawler versus Michael Cole at WrestleMania 27. Oh my God. I forgot about that. Dude, this match was like (laughs) 14 minutes long or something. Just absolutely unbelievable. And to think that like the amount of talent that didn't have a match at WrestleMania that year. And then these guys go out there and just stink the joint up. You figured Jerry Lawler would be able to have a good match with anyone, but maybe here he's just long past it. And Yeah. How old was he here? Like in his sixties? Possibly, but Michael Cole should not be anywhere near a ring. I don't know why no. they thought this would be a good idea. I just remember at the time thinking, this is absolutely brutal. Can I just say, by the way, so like earlier you mentioned about Kane and Chavo. And to me, that's not necessarily a terrible match because it was booked that way. I guess it was booked badly. But like you asked why it was on the pay-per-view. It was on the pay-per-view. What you find with a lot of WrestleManias and you'll find it on this WrestleMania 
a lot of the times there'll be random matches that are thrown on just to get someone a pay-per-view payday. Do you know what I mean? Like okay. someone like Kane, he's always in random matches every year at WrestleMania because typically he's not in a feud or a program, but it comes to WrestleMania. It's like, well, we can't leave Kane off the pay-per-view because otherwise Kane's going to be not happy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, okay, we do him versus Charlie. Then it's show day and it's like, oh, we've run over time, big time. Oh, we're going to have to turn this into more of an angle. Just ding, ding, choke slam, one, two, three. Sorry, Chavo. Coming, you know, you'll get your chance okay. next time. That's kind of how it works, you know? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, this match, this didn't need to be on Sunday Night Eat. This match just, just did not need to happen. Exactly. Um, yeah. My number one, can you guess? No, I thought it was going to be Buck, Gunn, and Butterbean. But you, yeah. It's Vince McMahon versus Bret the Hitman Hart, WrestleMania 26. Oh, of course. It's just your... Yeah. I always said, like, that Vince McMahon never really had a bad match until this match. And, dude, I thought, like, obviously you knew Bret was going to be completely limited in what he could do. Yeah. But you still felt like, okay, Bret is a psychological genius. I'm sure they'll pull something fun together. And this has <laughs> been a real-life feud for the last 20 years or whatever it had been. And, dude... They just completely stunk the joint up and they had the whole angle with like the Hart family turning on Vince and they're all kicking the crap out of Vince to the point where like the feud between Bret Hart and Vince McMahon, Bret Hart should be the biggest baby face in the world. And it gets to a point in this match where they're all just kicking the crap out of Vince so much. So all just dogpiling him. Where you start to feel sorry for Vince McMahon. It's of like, all people what? in the yes. world. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? Like, I was just so disappointed yeah. and thought it was completely brutal. And watching Brett wrestle with, with his jean shorts on at this point, it's like, ooh. And it's like, if he could have done a, you know, it was always such a shame how Brett's career ended and he never really got that last match. If he had the ability to do a last match, could they not have put him on with someone? that was really good and just tried to book it perfectly where it was just a really nice smoke and mirrors match would have been great. But instead we got this, it was yeah, terrible. Yeah. And for me, Bret Hart, my favorite wrestler of all time, but for me, the worst WrestleMania match of all time. All right. There are our lists. What did you guys think? Also, do you not be really embarrassing would be if you're in your room and your mum walks in and she catches you and you're not subscribed to us on YouTube, wouldn't that be very cringeworthy? I you can know, avoid you that. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can have, well, there is a way. You can just subscribe to us at The Villain Pod on YouTube and also follow all of our socials on The Villain Pod. And then that will never happen to you. So that's a way of doing it. Yeah, you know, actually on the Instagram last week, we I shared a reel about Billy Gunn uh, doing the famous sir on Bumble yeah. and Dudley through the table. And actually the fans reminded me that Billy Gunn actually injured his shoulder doing that move. And if you watch it back, when he lands, he actually puts his arm out. You see his shoulder kind of pop out almost doing that famous uh, through the table. Oh, wow. Ooh. And that's why the match at No Way Out, which we reviewed last week, uh, the match with the, the Dudley boys is only like five minutes long and they injure Billy with Gunn's shoulder in that match. So I, that was, okay. Billy Gunn was out for a long time after that. So yeah, but the fans picked up on that and i didn't so credit yeah I, I love i love it when the chillings like come come save the day for us with some intel <laughs> that we didn't otherwise know so that's awesome when that happens absolutely okay do you know what is not awesome when it happens if you're dean malenko dancing dancing <laughs> he hates dancing dude yeah so continuing from last week's episode dean malenko is backstage still expressing his anti-dancing sentiments still on his crusade to rid the wwf of those dancing fools God, he hates dancing. Honestly, man, he can't stand it. But Eddie has something else on his mind. China, which is the beginning signs of Latino heat, which we both love. Okay. But this sets us up for the next match, which is the Radicals without Chris Benoit. He comes along later in another match. Take on Too Cool in China and lose again for the second time in two episodes to Too Cool in nearly 10 minutes. No excuse there. Uh, I wasn't feeling this. What about you, mate? Uh, it certainly wasn't as good as uh, last, last week's. week's where we saw um, the Radicals versus Two Core and Rikishi. That being said, I thought it was a pretty good match. I thought it was pretty well done. I thought watching this, it's like, can we not put the Radicals over this time? Do you know what I mean? Like Two Core yeah. with China. Could the Radicals not have won? Um, but really, still no. the, yeah, still no. But really, this was the building blocks, it felt like, for the Eddie Guerrero and China 
storyline, which we got, which like you said, was awesome and fantastic. Um, so I guess we should be grateful then. Yeah. For that. And it you know the what? Yeah. Yes. And Eddie really shined in this match. I thought yeah. he did the, you know, the, the, the famous Eddie Guerrero kind of, he runs away on his knees. He crawls on his knees and does the cuddle of the person standing, you know, which is always really funny. Um, yeah, Eddie, definitely the star of this match. We get another wardrobe malfunction in this match towards the end. Poor China's pants rip and <laughs> butt it, falls out. It, it looked really bad. Her butt's falling out. It looks like at one point her front, her front butt was going to fall out as well. And she's going to try and get to the finish, which I think she actually pins Eddie Guerrero for the finish, right? Which is pretty crazy when you think about it. This is WrestleMania yeah. 16. Yeah. By WrestleMania 20, Eddie Guerrero will be in the world title match Champ, at WrestleMania, yeah. you know, but here he's getting pinned by China. Um, honestly, I thought this was all right, but I also feel like the crowd was kind of burnt out by this point and just kind of, yeah. you know, wanted to get to the end, but um, no, Eddie Guerrero was star of the match for sure. Yeah, for sure. I was kind of burning out at this point as well myself. They show a competition winner receiving their invitation to be flown over to go and see WrestleMania 2000, which would, would have been wild at the time, dude, wouldn't it? If you get a knock on the door and it's like, hey, we're WWE, we're your winner. Must have been insane. Yeah, not an email or anything. Just come Not an email, just house. knocking on your door. Yeah. <laughs> and she's caught totally unaware. She's got like a crafty cigarette in her hand, just answering the door, you know? Um the Chris, Jer- why I'm bringing this up though is the Chris Jericho promotional material that you mentioned in the short that you posted in the past week was on full display, where it's um, the three other competitors of the Fatal Four Way main event, but instead of Mac Mick Foley, it's Chris Jericho, and it's just funny to see that they actually broadcast that previous idea that they had in the actual airing of the WrestleMania itself. I just thought it's kind of interesting that they let that slip. We see Kurt Angle asking the head of security for extra security, please, for after he retains his belts, as he is worried he'll be mobbed by children and adults alike. (laughs) And the way he talks down to the guy, both in his words, choice of words, and his tone of speaking is so funny and so well done and just like pure Kurt Angle by this point. Uh, to set, to explain what this is, is he holds the European title and the Intercontinental title. And the next match is, it's kind of like two matches in one, back to back, one for the European title, one for the Intercontinental title. It's like a two full match, so essentially like two singles matches stuck together. But each full of the two full matches is a different is for a different title, which is kind of odd if you ask me. And both matches or falls feature Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, triple threat. Just so everyone knows, uh, Kurt Angle doesn't have to be pinned or any part of it. You know, whoever wins takes the belt. Do them one at a time. Benoit takes the IC title via pinfall after a diving headbutt on Y2J. Actually, we don't need to do them one at a time. Then Y2J secures the European title from a pinfall following a lion salt on Benoit. And it's kind of interesting that they set up the European title as like the second one. Like that was a mistake, important. I thought. Yeah. So people have gone back and said, oh, this is a really underrated match. And I feel like if this match was done like a year later, it could have been the main event of a WrestleMania or the main event of a pay-per-view at least, because you've got, you know, three awesome mm-hmm. talents and they're all three of them here are making their WrestleMania debuts. But it was a weird way how they set up where the first fall was for the IC title, then the second fall was for the European. So People didn't really care after the IC title. It was like, they don't care who becomes European champion because as we've discussed <laughs> they don't before, anyway. yeah. right, like the European championship, like the most pointless championship in WF history. So honestly, I it just seemed overbooked. This whole entire show seemed overbooked. I honestly think it should have just been for two titles, both the titles. I mean, I'm guessing mm-hmm. they wanted to split up the IC title and the European title. So I get that. Um, again, they should have just unified them when they were together anyway, but doing it this way, clearly it was a way of getting the titles off Kurt without him being pinned. And this way he could lose both belts without losing. And it Mm -hmm. would give him something, a gripe and out something to moan about for months and months and months. And it would free him up as well to go into that Mm -hmm. kind of world title scene later on. Um, but Dude, the crowd was just really burnt out by this point, I feel. The crowd was pretty dead throughout the whole thing, and it ended up being pretty long. Um, Before the match, like, and the guys worked hard. Like, they were doing some creative spots and stuff, but the crowd just didn't really care. 
before the match, they showed, funny enough, from Sunday Night Heat, I think it was, was Kurt Angle beating up Bob Backlund. Mm -hmm. And he put him in the cross-face chicken wing. Mm -hmm. And then during the match, Kurt Angle was using the cross-face chicken wing. And I feel like clearly what happened here is they've got to a point with Kurt Angle using the, the Olympic slam or the angle slam. And they probably said, oh, we feel like you should have a submission. And they were toying around with different ideas of what would be a good submission for Kurt Angle. And it seemed like the first idea was the cross-face chicken wing. And yeah. he tried it here. And it's funny, like, because Kurt Angle puts the cross-face chicken wing on Bob Backlund earlier. And so many people do the cross-face chicken wing wrong, like really, really badly. Like, you've got to get that left arm behind their back. That's the chicken wing part. Do you know what I mean? Right. If the arm is out like this and you're just like hooking them like that and holding their chin, it's not a cross face chicken wing. So um, he tries it in this match, obviously did work out for him later on. Clearly someone just said, Hey, why don't you just do the uh, ankle, ankle lock? lock like Ken Shamrock. Shamrock's gone now. You can have the ankle mm -hmm. lock. Okay, perfect. And it worked for Kurt Angle. And yep. I'm really glad it did because if he had taken the cross face chicken wing, then it probably wouldn't have ended up being my special move now. So history would have been changed. But no, yes, indeed. the guys worked really, really hard. It's a cool sign for the future of this company with these three talents, but it's late in the show and people don't want to be sitting there for hours and hours just to see who's going to become bloody European champion. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> Backstage, we see Vince tell Michael Cole that he intends to fix things and make things right tonight. This is juxtaposed by a shot of Triple H telling Stephanie that it's not about making things right, rather than proving who is the best, which turns her on a little bit. <laughs> These are segments to provide interest in the main event, but I'm not really feeling them so much this time around, are you? Like, they seem to kind of lack any energy. So even Shut the Hell Up Juice, which we keep mocking on from The Rock the other week, was dumb, but at least it brought an energy to proceedings. These just don't really have anything. Yeah, there was not a lot of life behind a no. lot of this pay-per-view. It's very odd. And I just, it did not feel like a WrestleMania, huh? It didn't, not at all. Honestly, not it didn't really all. feel like a WWE <laughs> like, You know, with the, right. the errors and just like, the lack of energy and care. Yeah, it's, it's really, a bizarre thing to watch. Really bizarre. Yeah, you'd like that main event that they're pumping up, wouldn't you? Well, you can't have it yet because we have to sit through yet another tag match, multi-competitor match, Rikishi and Kane destroy X-Pac and Road Dog in four minutes flat. Sort of a dead era for DX, but I do like the Run DMC entrance music. Oh, yeah. It's that, good. That slammed, yeah. It does. Yeah, it did. Yeah. JR and the King trade places for a moment as the King sticks up for women. What do you mean, Jezebel? Referring to Tori. And JR ogles them. I didn't say she wasn't hot. <laughs> so if you remember the surprisingly fun and quirky Kane, x Park, Tory, Paul Bearer match from last week's No Way Out 2000 episode, this is not really a repeat of that quality wise, I would say. I wouldn't blame Rikishi and Road Dog specifically, so the other two competitors who weren't in the, the last version, but I just, I'm so done with multi competitive matches by this point, just so done. And I'd rather just have those two, x Park and Kane. I mean, like no gimmicks, no managers even. Don't even have Tory or Paul Bearer in there. Just, I, I just I'd much rather had those two just going toe to toe. There's no breathing room in this, no real story being told. All the shenanigans were back ended, which we'll get to probably. But yeah, there was, this was an odd one. I was just kind of checked out by this point. What about you? I remember at the time as a kid being like, why is Rikishi and Kane teaming up? That seems a little forced. And I, so the fact that I thought that back then kind of says a lot. Right. Yes. And <laughs> I just said about how it's WrestleMania. So. A lot of the times they're just cramming people on to give them a yeah. WrestleMania payday. Exactly. Because if you don't, if someone's off WrestleMania and they're, you know, mid card and up and they're left off WrestleMania, they're going to be very unhappy. And when you're running a company, you don't want unhappy talent, obviously, you know, if Taka Michinoku is not on the show, you're kind of like whatever. Right. But someone like Kane or Rikishi, you know, they deserve to be on the pay-per-view for sure. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff they kind of force feed into it. What's funny about this, I was doing a little bit of research and X-Pac was actually offered a match for WrestleMania, a singles match against Jericho for the Intercontinental Championship. Mm. And X-Pac turned it down because he felt like he wanted to pay off his feud with Kane, which years later he admitted uh, the feud mm. with Kane had, had kind of fizzled out by time WrestleMania and I probably should have done the IC title match with Jericho. 
which I would agree with, agree with, right? Like you, you, you got to respect his kind of dedication to the story or the universe that they're putting out, I guess. But yeah, career wise, probably a r- totally wrong decision. Well, I just think I think Xbox versus Jericho for an you know, IC title that sounds like a really would have been match. lovely. Yeah, show would have been great. Could have done with that, you know. Um, could have saved it. Well, right. Could have helped mm, it. Maybe not saved could've it. Could have helped it. Could've um, helped it. Um, yes, but no. I thought I actually thought this match was entertaining i didn't realize it was that quick four minutes what i wrote yeah. in my notes was like oh really nice quick match that's cool but then the aftermath was kind of long so it's kind of like right. oh do you know what yeah, I mean? the actual match itself was four minutes but it, there's padding we'll put it that way jim ross with the famous call like the crowd goes nuts of course when rikishi gives tori a stink face yeah. jim ross on commentary tori has a bad case of ass breath i was like dude like what are we watching I know. Tori has a bad case of ass breath. Of ass breath. Not ass breath. Again, ass breath. Ass breath. Again, <laughs> WrestleMania. Yeah, the exactly. celebration of wrestling. Yeah. I just Your think Super Bowl. It, yeah, it's just so funny when Tori's like, you know, Paul Bear is chasing the crowd's cheering. Kane grabs her by the neck. The crowd's like, yeah, kill her. Then they're like, yeah, Rikishi, stick your big butt in her face. We have this stuff with Pete Rose as well, yeah. which well, as a youngster, I never really knew who Pete Rose was. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I still really don't because he's a baseball player. And unless right. you live in America, well, I guess baseball is popular in Japan as well, right? But yes. in Europe, it's not popular at all. So I had no idea who Pete Rose was. They had that little ongoing WrestleMania feud with him and Kane. I'm not sure if they ever really paid that off. But um, yeah, the aftermath seemed to take a long time. And then they did the dance at the end of the show. Um yeah, the match itself I thought was all right. DX's heels, never really into. We've discussed that before. Mm-mm. Again, just another match, another way to get four big names on the pay per view. Yes, indeed. The Rock says catchphrases at Kevin Kelly. So now we've seen all four competitors of the main event backstage because that's all you got. That's all you got from The Rock. He just said catchphrases. So we might as well just get on with it, right? A fatal four way. Elimination match for the WWF Championship. This still is a cruel 38 minutes out of our lives. But Ooh. actually, isn't, but it isn't like that bad. It's just really long and messy, um, which we'll get into. So, but Triple H wins as Vince makes things right by betraying The Rock. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. But I would say like the first 10 minutes of this maybe was super boring. And I, maybe it picks up in the middle and then completely just goes off the rails at the end. Is That's my summary. What what do you reckon? I've got a lot of problems with this. Oh. Yeah. It I is mean, messy. I mean, dude, it's just, it, it's a hat on a hat on a hat. Okay? So it's like, it's WrestleMania. Uh, okay? We've got so many things going on, right? We've got, the world title being on the line at WrestleMania. Yeah. That's yeah. all you need, in my opinion, for WrestleMania. But we yeah. have that. Then, not only that, but it's not a singles, it's a four-way for that, right? Then, we also have the fact that it's Mick Foley's last match, a retirement match, right? Which could be a whole main event itself. In itself. I mean, right. that's why we're covering, we've covered it right. twice. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right? That's why we're here today doing this episode. Right. Then, on top of that, it's a McMahon in every corner, which is completely, like, Force it's not right. needed so whatsoever. It's just way, so much, like hat on a hat on a hat, way overbooked, right? Not only that, but the whole time you're watching this, you're thinking, ugh, this should have just been The Rock versus Triple H, the top baby face and the top hill for the world championship. So yeah, a lot of that going on. Then the McMahon in every corner, clearly someone came up with this backstage in the uh, creative meeting. Like, well, what about, a McMahon in each corner and uh, I love it. And they went mm-hmm. for it and it just, okay. So Stephanie with triple H. Okay. That makes sense. Yes. Shane. I think it just started managing big show. Okay. But the other two, it made the rock look like a complete idiot to go with Vince McMahon in the first place, because yeah. it's like, you knew we couldn't trust Vince McMahon. And it's like, why would the rock even want Vince McMahon? Like the rock's character Never was never like that. Do you know what I mean? Like right, you yeah, need no, someone, yeah. right? And the but the fact that Vince turned on him as well just made him look like a complete dumbass. And then you got Linda McMahon out there with Mick Foley for his last match. It's like, what's Linda McMahon got why? to do with Mick yeah, Foley? Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. He's supposed to be this like hardcore legend, and he's got little old Linda McMahon with him at ringside. It's just 
Ugh. Yeah, um, you, I didn't really pick up on the rock thing, but you're right. Like since the nation of domination, like since he dealt with that, he doesn't like fall in line to anyone, right? That's kind of the point of him. Right, exactly. So then to just kind of be managed by the CEO only to get betrayed is kind of embarrassing for his character. It yeah. just made him look like a dumbass. I yeah, thought. made like, him look Why yeah, would he made feel like stupid. he needed Vince's help? He's the rock. He doesn't need anyone's help. Do you know what I mean? Right, yeah. Um. So, yeah, th- they got rid of Big Show pretty quickly. Yeah. Th- but like, and, and then it, the psychology was just silly because it comes down to, it comes down to the rock and Foley are supposed to be kind of like teammates against triple H. And it's like, so they've got the two on one advantage and triple H still wins. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right. And uh, along for a big portion of the match, Foley and triple H were working together to double team the rock. And it's kind of like the commentary tried to try to save it by being like, Oh, well, Mick Foley wants triple H by it by himself. And it's kind of like, no. Like, okay. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then, that for the world title matches during this era, there was this formula of brawl around the arena, all smoke and mirrors, like weapon shots. There's always like a Spanish announced table yeah. bump. Like I feel like Austin kind of created this style of main event. Like before that, bearing in mind before this, you'd have like a Bret Hart match or a Shawn Michaels match. And before that, it, Hogan, they really, yeah, Attitude Era really cemented that formula of we're going to brawl around the crowd. You know, we're going to do the announce table. We're going to get the steel chairs out, um, which I guess people fell in love with, but I don't know, a little bit tiresome watching this. Yeah. Basically, watching this match, the only thing I can think of is they did the right thing like the month, the next month or whenever it was, when they did Backlash. Backlash they just yeah. did The Rock versus Triple H and The Rock went over uh, to win the world title with Stone Cold Steve Austin's help. I don't know why that did not happen here. That needed to happen here. The McMahon in every corner, I think just really, I don't know what's worse. The fact it was a four way or the fact that there was a McMahon in every corner, but either way. And it was also the first WrestleMania for a heel to win. And it's like, Mm. typically like, okay, I think it's good at some point a heel should win at WrestleMania. I don't think this was the right point to do it, but Okay, you're gonna do it, Triple H. Fair enough, but the fact that he does it in a four way, I, I don't know. I'm just was not a fan of this match at all. I actually think it would have been better with Jericho over McFoley as well. McFoley here, he looks like he's put on about twenty pounds since No Way Out because clearly yeah. he thought he was done. And last minute they gave him the call and said, "Come on, Vince wants you to main event at WrestleMania. He wants you to have that moment." And it's like it's McFoley's last match, but he's just like you know, leaving halfway through the match. Yeah, it's that's like really him. important. That right. like Mick Fo- so it's elimination. Big Show goes out first, like you said. This is his retirement match. We've done a three episode arc on this. Like we care more about his character, you know, than the WWE right. because it, it made a big, di- it was a big deal around two- WrestleMania, um, excuse me, Royal Rumble 2000. Obviously a big deal during No Way Out, the Hell in a Cell. And then he's just eliminated second. Yeah, in, it's like-, uh, like Fatal 4-Way. And again, the harm up, you know, oh, like, yeah, wow. Like that should mean that like, that should have a lot of like a tremendous weight behind it. Well, I'm it glad it just doesn't. It, yeah, completely. And I'm glad this wasn't his last match because oh, dude. his elimination, <laughs> Triple H puts the rock on the announcer's table and Mick Foley tries to do the elbow drop from the second rope to the announcer's table. Get the distance. Just It's like a four foot short of hitting <sighs> the rock. So bad. He like smashes his sternum into the side of the announcer's table. Makes such gets, a loud noise. Oh, yeah. Gross. Then he gets thrown yeah. in the ring and Triple H gives him the pedigree. And the pedigree is actually pretty mistimed as well. It, like took a pretty bad pedigree. It was like, oh man, is this like the last thing that Mick Foley's ever going to do in wrestling? Just, you, mean, oh. you mean the second pedigree on the chair? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. It, was it was terrible to watch, wasn't it? It was late. Kind of poorly yeah. timed. Um, yeah. So you just thought, geez, if this is the last we've seen of Mick Foley, that is a real big shame. Obviously it wasn't. He did a whole bunch of <laughs> comeback matches and everything else. But um, yeah, just, I don't know who booked all this stuff because Russo is long gone by this point. So they can't blame Russo. They love to blame Vince Russo. He had nothing to do with this. Just really, really overbooked. And it's funny because people look back so fondly on the Attitude Era. And I've always said this, it seemed like the TV episodes were so much fun. The act, the pay-per-views, a lot of them, not all of them, but 
a lot of the Attitude Era pay-per-views, not so very much. good. And this was not a very good one. That's a completely not a good one. No, last week you mentioned, hey, if this was like what they did with Backlash, Triple H versus The Rock, it would have been good. Watching this, in, in that moment after Big Show and Mankind go out, but before the McMahon stuff just goes off the rails at the end, that kind of part in between with The Rock and Triple H, was, that's the part that I enjoyed. I was like, yeah, Marty's right. This is, this is nice. This right. Is but, but oh man, by the way, did you notice when The Rock holds the stairs and Triple H has the chair and they hit each other's weapon at the same time and the rock falls backwards how close he was to splitting his head open on the corner of the other stairs oh i didn't notice that no oh dude the rock falls straight backwards onto his head and his head misses the other stairs that are placed by the the ring post the corner of it the shut corner of it by about two inches oh geez just like his head just it was not uh it made me feel like really like obviously we know it didn't happen Ugh. but like we're just watching it was nasty like so close to misery it was gross horrible did you do you ever see that clip of i think it's seth rollins and they've raised like the hell in the cell and then they're bringing the hell in the cell down but the hell in the cell at the bottom of it it has like spikes which go into the floor to attach to the floor and he stood underneath it and it's coming down <laughs> and he only like last second moves out the way. It's really scary. Yeah. yeah. That, is, is that for the um, Bray Wyatt match? The, it might have been. Yeah. I can't remember now. I, don't, you should, no, I haven't seen that. I'm going to Google it. Yeah, you should Google it. It's it's really like, oh, like a holy shit moment. Oh. Um, yeah. Like these mistakes, these, these things that could have been just deadly. Um, yeah. I, dude, I mean, Shane McMahon out there. Do you prefer Shane as a heel or a baby face? Oh, that's really difficult because he was quite good at both, to be fair. He was kind of good at both. Yeah. Mm. That's really tough, actually. Let's ask the I'm viewers. I'm going to think about that. Yeah. Let's ask, yeah. I'll put a post out. That's okay. a great question, bud. To the chillins, did you prefer Shane McMahon as a baby face or Shane McMahon as a heel? We would love to know. Um, but yeah. Dude, I mean, if I had to say something positive about this, Triple H is a pile driver, and it's actually kind of strange to see pile drivers in WWE. You know, it's like, oh, that's kind of odd. Um, obviously, we haven't seen one of them in years mm-hmm. in the WWE. But um, no, overall, I thought it's a disappointing match. Uh, overall, Sam, what would you say was your favorite match on this show? I know you said it's the Hardcore Battle Royal, but is that what you're sticking with? Yeah, it's the Hardcore Battle Royal. Now, the... If it was like what I think was the best match on the show, it's the Dudley, that's the triangle triple threat thing, the ladder match. It was really good. But for me, these hardcore battle, the hardcore battle royal is not something that comes around every day. It's basically a one off kind of. Mm-hmm. There was like the gimmick battle royal from in the future, but that kind of sucked. This thing is just like a nice little time capsule. We get the Mean Street Posse. I remember it vividly. It's goofy. It's just bad it's messy but it's super fun now you <laughs> i feel like you didn't share that fun that i had with it but for me it sticks out and i just like enjoy it very comfortably it's it's a nice warm piece of media that i will cherish for the rest of my life and go back to every now and again maybe once every two years i'll watch the hardcore battle royal i'm struggling to come up with a favorite match i honestly i i didn't mind the radicals and too cool in china I didn't mind uh, Road Dog and Kane. Sorry, Road Dog and X Buck against Kane and Rikishi. I guess I'm just going to go with the triangle ladder match because the guys did work very hard and the crowd really did like it and they did do a lot of you know dangerous and and big spots and everything else. So yeah, I go with the triangle ladder match. Um, That's the problem of the show, is what you just said. Is when you're saying about a WrestleMania. Oh, I didn't mind the two cool radicals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. When we're trying to pick the match of the night for a WrestleMania, and you're kind of like umming and ahhing between uh, like a two cool match, no disrespect <laughs> to them. I feel like that's the problem. This show it was wildly <laughs> disappointing, wildly overbooked, as you said. It's it's uh, it's a it's a. An, I'm going to call this pay per view an anomaly. It was <laughs> yeah. it was oddly rough production for WWE. Just everything about it was just slightly off. It was just this weird blip. What so you- for like cult, like for relevancy, like WrestleMania relevancy, I'd say it's kind of high because it's just like a what not to do almost. It's a bizarre, it's a bizarre time capsule. Well, we haven't got all night, but what no. would you say was the worst match of the pay-per-view? Uh, the cat fight. 
I'm gonna go with the hardcore battle royal. Or oh, actually, no, I'm oh. gonna go. I'm gonna. I, I kind of want to go with the hardcore battle royal, but I think just so because your favorite could be my worst. But actually, I think I'm gonna go with that head cheese versus TNA match because the psychology was just so bad, so all over the place, killed the crowd. Yeah. Um, and what was that doing on a WrestleMania? I do not know. Overall, Sam, a star rating for this pay per view. This is a thing with the star rating for this. I feel like if this was any other year, it'd be so, so low. But because it's 2000, it still has that like nostalgia. It's almost like you get an extra star just for the nostalgia, it seems, in my head. I'm going to give it an extra half star for <laughs> nostalgia. So with nostalgia, I'd give it a 2.5 because for me, there were two good matches. No, actually, I'm going to not say, no, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to give it a two out of five even with nostalgia having watched it yeah and that's a shame because this is my most watched pay-per-view like i said <laughs> I, got, I got the vhs and from school someone at school and i just used to watch that on sick days like i told you and watched it over and over again and i kind of so it's not like um i'm blinded by nostalgia you know i used to look like I thought I'd love it when I watched it again, and it's just not good at all. That's, like, that's the thing with the attitude. That's era. Such a lot, shame. Yeah, a lot of the attitude era just doesn't hold up today. It's it's interesting, isn't it? And I feel like the example. Royal Rumble. I feel like the Royal Rumble 2000 did hold up for me. You said it kind of didn't so much for you. For me, I was still wildly entertained with it. It's always going to be my favorite pay per view. I think this one, no way. This really, I really kind of am soured on it now. You yeah. know what? I think I'm going to give this pay per view a 1.5. Wow. Okay. I can see why. I can see why. Yeah. Hmm. And at least you had that match you really loved. There's nothing on this show I really enjoyed. So <laughs> I guess that's fair. Honestly, I thought this was going to be the first episode where you score something higher than I do, because I think I always score higher than you for some reason. But no, still, wowzers. Okay, man. 1.5 for WrestleMania 2000. Yeah, Oof. and a 2 for me. So 1.75. And we're talking about primetime WWE year 2000. WrestleMania flagship pay-per-view. <laughs> this, this is the lower... No, it's not. Never mind. I was say, but it's light. I mean, this is fighting around... Heatwave 98, whatever it was, got higher, right, mm -hmm. on the show. And this is tying with, no, it's not, I was going to say, but it's down there with Legends of Wrestling, whatever it's called, Heroes of Wrestling. <laughs> Jeez. And this is WWE yeah, pay-per-view. It, yeah, it's, it's, it, can't, it can't get any worse than Legends of Wrestling or Heroes of Wrestling, whatever it was. But yeah, it's getting down there. Well, Sam, yep. this was our first WrestleMania that we covered. I'm sure with WrestleMania... Coming up soon, yeah. we'll be covering a lot more WrestleManias. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is probably one of the worst ones that we will cover. Well, so I was going to say it can, can only go from here. here. Well, I was going to say that, but they're they're having like quite a cup. I haven't actually seen a lot, but I've heard that there are some dud WrestleManias. So there we'll see if dud. it's only going to be up from here. But we'll see. I'm I'm cautiously optimistic on this one. I feel like this is pretty low. I yeah. feel like it can really only go up from here. So I'm excited to cover more. What did you guys think? Are, are we too harsh on this? I don't think so, but we have to ask that question, right? Let us I don't know. think we are. Yeah, let us that, know for sure. That would be fun. Well, this has been our Mick Foley first retirement story arc. Yeah. I, I, I feel like Mick Foley having a match at the age 60, I'd be interested to see it. Uh, I'd like to ask the Chillins this as well. Who do you want to see as Mick Foley's last opponent? Me personally, I think it needs to be Matt Cardona the king of the death match, wherever he calls himself now. I think that would be really fun. Um, but, you know, what do you people think? Who should Mick Foley wrestle in his last match? I'm pretty sure that's all we have for this week. Uh, like Sam said earlier, please follow us on the social media at The Villain Pod. Give, check us out. Give us a comment. Give us a like. Share. Give us a review. If you want to have your name shouted out on the show, a five-star review. We would really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, that's all I have from me. All right. Yes. I was going to say after watching this pay-per-view, oh, I feel like I should pick next, like to be fair to me. But I think this is kind of my fault, right? Because I originally wanted to do WrestleMania, uh, Royal Rumble 2000, WrestleMania 2000, Backlash 2000. Like you change it to like fit a theme. But either way, it was my idea to do this frigging WrestleMania 2000. This is entirely my fault. <laughs> I've only got myself to blame. So I guess it's your pick next week, man. All <laughs> right. Good for me. All right. And that's all I have. So everybody have a good week. Till next week. 